hello everybody. Um, thank you for joining Mario and I. Um, I'll just introduce myself quickly and then I'll, 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 I'll hand back to Mario and, and he can do his thing. My name's David Berlowitz. Um, I'm a physio. Um, I'm a researcher at the Austin and the University of Melbourne. Um, uh, and uh, I've, uh, I've kind of known Mario obliquely for almost 20 years, um, uh, but have recently had much more to do with him um, because of our in, in engagement in the Spinal Research Institute. But um, I'll, uh, Mario is now going to tell you about himself and uh, we'll have a bit of a chat. Yep, like David said, um, we are Austin alumni and we go back a long time. Uh, this is already from 2001 when I had a road traffic accident that made me a C5 quadriplegic. And at that time, Dave was finishing his PhD uh, at the Austin as well. So it's been an interesting road for both of us. What we'd like to do today is to talk to you a little bit about, obviously the whole COVID pandemic uh, has affected everyone in different ways. And certainly for us in the spinal injured community, it has, um, a set of effects that we'd like to talk to you about in relation to respiratory function. As you may know, um, it's talked about uh, that COVID causes a pneumonia and that people in wheelchairs may be exceptionally susceptible. Um, it's sort of more true to say that we are no more susceptible to the pneumonia than the rest of the population, um, comparing for our age and our other comorbidities and sicknesses like diabetes, or obesity or whatever. But once we did contract COVID, there arise the problem because of uh, necessarily because of a spinal injury, our respiratory function is impaired. And I think because of that, we have a few, are likely to have a few more complications than the average person. Um, you may not know that COVID doesn't cause a standard pneumonia like an infection would. It causes a hemorrhagic pneumonia, which leads to a lot of bleeding in the lungs. And COVID can have a long-term impact on lungs even after pneumonia resolves in causing a lot of fibrosis and scarring. So what we'd like to talk today is a lot of bit, is more to putting ourselves in a situation where our immune system is as good as it can be and optimizing our respiratory function um, so that we don't contract the infection in the first place. So I think what I'd like to talk to you, David, is about is we have carers, yeah? How can we work that environment to uh, minimize our chances of getting the infection? Um, thanks, Mario. I, I mean, I think, I think the, the aspect of, of, of how we all deal with the community is really important. It's the same for us in, in some ways, um, uh, working in a hospital, one of the real keys, I think, is is actually good disclosure, like proper sharing of information. It's really incredibly critical, it seems, that we all um, share what's actually going on with us. We pay good attention to our social distancing, to the masks, and to washing our hands. And that's, like, that's just the most important thing. But for example, um, at, at the hospital, we have people, some of our staff work in other hospitals and we don't stop them working in other hospitals, but we make it really clear that it's obviously much more important if we know they're working in another hospital, because if things went bad, then we can deal with it. And I suppose, I mean, I don't know, you, you have carers obviously more than me, I don't. I have daughters, not the same thing. Um, <laughs> but the, the, um, uh, the issue there around making sure that people have proper exchanges of information with the people that are coming in to provide care in their house. Absolutely, Dave. So what I've done with my carers, I initially had a team of about eight carers. And I think that at this time, um, you know, minimizing contact with, uh, exposing yourself to as few people as possible is really vital. And so what I've done is I've discussed with my carers and I've, shared my carers in such a way with other people who use the same carers so that now I only use four carers regularly 
and two not so regularly. And the two that I don't use regularly, I don't have that much contact with them because they do my external activities like shopping and that sort of thing. Yeah. I think that um, with that, I think you mentioned also the use of the wearing the mask. That's really yeah. important. Yeah. Yeah, no, look, absolutely. So obviously the most important thing is, is, is masking when we're out and about and when we're exposed to, to the rest of the world. But um, we do know that some people with neuromuscular um, disorders, not just spinal cord injury, but other reasons, can, can often kind of sense the load on their breathing um, when they yeah. put a mask on. So some people who have kind of small lungs or weak lungs or lung disease, it's really obvious um, uh, and, and well understood in the way that um, certainly Victoria, but I think in most places how we're approaching masking is that if you've got a medical reason why <clears throat> wearing a, a mask is challenging, then you talk to people about that and that's okay. But there are also different masks that have sort of different um, uh, inspiratory resistance and feel different. So. The surgical masks that we all wear as health professionals all the time and always did before COVID, um, they tend to have not much um, resistance on breathing in, but some of the ones that we're making ourselves at home or the ones we might buy over the interweb, uh, some of those can actually make it feel like it's a bit hard to breathe. And so you get a bit short of breath and stuff like that. So if, if you're in that situation, it's worth playing around with the various options. Um, because because different masks do feel different on different people. And that's a good point you make about people making their own masks. Um, it looks nice, but there may be a, a need for you to use a professionally made mask to decrease the resistance. Yeah, yeah. And just the, 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 the simple surgical ones you can get in the supermarket or the, or the pharmacy are completely like they're good masks. They're, and they, they don't have much inspiratory load. So, so if perchance people are having trouble with that, then, then that's one way to go. Yeah. And I think while we're talking about masks, it's important to say that, you know, our understanding of why we use masks has changed in, mm. in the last few weeks. It's because it's no longer um, an accepted thing that COVID is only transmitted by droplets. It's quite clear now that it's transmitted by aerosols. So we really need to use masks all the time when we're in an exposed situation to other people, not just for their sex, but for our sex as well. And I think that um, we're in the situation we just talked about where we have problems wearing masks, it then becomes vitally important to distance and to minimize your exposure to other people, I guess. Yeah, no, absolutely. We're One thing, Dave, a lot of us already have a certain amount of sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, um, we, as a spinal injured community, you know, we can have, how can we optimize our respiratory function? Uh, yeah, well, um, the, the sleep stuff is obviously really important. So as Mario knows, sleep, um, sleep apnea is incredibly common after cervical injury. Um, in most people with any form of spinal cord injury, periodic leg movements are quite common. So twitches at night, what people sometimes think about as spasms are, are also this sleep related phenomenon that happens during, during the night. Um, people with high injuries have interruption to their melatonin rhythms. So you live with a kind of a jet lag all the time. And then we've got all the COVID factors. <laughs> So we're not going outside. So our eyes are not seeing daylight. So our circadian rhythm can go off. Um, our usual cues about getting up and getting out and going to work and often doing other things, they're not there. So people's rhythms are all shifting. Um, in, in both the non-disabled and the disabled population, it's occurring equally to all of us, it seems. But there's some particular risk factors or risks around COVID that, that probably are, are more challenging here. Things around our tendency to all have slightly, our, all of our mental health is taking a bit of a battering. All of us are drinking a bit more. 
all of us are eating a bit more because you know man what else are you gonna do absolutely yeah but um and, and so all of these things i think are just taking the edge off our quality sleep and it's our qualities we know that quality sleep amount and quantity are critically important to our immune function critically yeah and so having having a situation where there's all these external factors that are messing with that is is is, is putting us behind the eight ball. So anything people can do. And it is like you were sort of intimating Mario, it's, it's, it's kind of one of the few things we've actually got some control over. Mm. So you know, it'd be nice to exercise some control where you can. I'm trying to have the odd AFD. Yeah. yeah. You know, if you do have a problem with um, sleep apnea at the moment, yeah. it's going to be quite uh, problematic. Um, what are the availabilities now in this current environment to actually get your sleep patterns analysed? Yeah, so look, um, urgent care is being provided and um, what we're seeing in things like in the cancer space and in the cardiac disease is that some, peop some people are sort of delaying presentation to hospitals and to doctors and to other health professionals because they're quite rightly scared and everything's a bit weird and so people are putting stuff off but if it's urgent it will get dealt with you know our emergency departments are have got their COVID work but then the rest of their work is pretty much the same as normal because people still get sick and so if you need help with a medical problem you should go on it off and get it one of the few advantages in some ways of COVID is that a lot of the administrative and financial and bureaucratic barriers to like effective, particularly teleconsultation, have gone away. So um, it's now actually quite straightforward because certainly around here, we've made it easier for doctors to get paid for, for you to be able to get a teleconsult with a new GP, with a specialist, um, and, and that that is now being mainstreamed a bit more. So actually getting access to health professionals um, in, some, in some ways for people with, you know, living with, with physical disability has kind of almost got easier. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, for many, in many aspects of life, um, for people in wheelchairs, things have gotten much better. One thing that really is not that great is exercise. No, yeah. So, you know, because we can't get out that much to our usual places because for me for instance i should do my um my um aerobic exercise in shopping centers but there's lots of flat reading that to be done yeah and i can't do that now obviously it's putting you on the spot a bit but <laughs> do you have any um uh respiratory exercises or some point us to somewhere where we can go to get something to do some breathing exercise and optimize our breathing function yeah look so so we do know from sort of from what's called cross-sectional data so from data in big populations primarily from switzerland that having stronger breathing muscles is associated with a lower risk of getting pneumonia or a chest infection yeah but what we don't know yet is really how much benefit training those muscles has in terms of your risk of infection we're coincidentally almost at the end of a study that will help understand that, that the folks in Switzerland are, are leading, but it's not quite clear yet. We do know that breathing exercises, singing, um, all kinds of things can strengthen your breathing muscles. And so there's absolutely no way that does any harm. And at the moment, it's probably a good thing. The best way to get breathing exercises is to get puffed is to do, as you say, aerobic exercise, but it's quite challenging. And, you know, certainly in Melbourne, it's winter. So, you know, it's not much fun wheeling out up and down the footpath at the moment, but you can definitely be doing strengthening exercises in your home. You know, a bit of TheraBand, a few weights, those kind of things. And um, any of that sort of stuff is beneficial. I think for, for, for everybody living with, living in this environment at the moment, we've all, it's all pretty rubbish. We're all just trying to do the best we can. And so anything you can do to take some control over your health is, is probably good for your mental, physical health and also just to stop you spending 12 hours in front of PlayStation or the Netflix. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that 
you know, when this first started, the first time round, we it looked like there was an end in sight. Yeah. And we could do anything, we could just do anything we liked and cope till we got to the end. It's going to be a bit of a longer haul now, isn't it? Yeah. This I is think it's really time that we started looking after ourselves and these small changes because that's the thing with this COVID thing. Um, it seems to uh, affect, it doesn't, you know, we were told things like people's age made a difference and so things like that. But it seems to be the more fit you are. And I think that it's of paramount importance that because we can't get that much exercise, we must cut down on the eating, on the drinking. Yeah. And, you know, I love cooking. And this is the perfect time to do cooking, you know, because you've got all the time in the world to check out the recipes and stuff. But, you know, go easy on the cooking and the eating, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, indeed. Those things you have control over, it's nice to try and take some control back because the external factors, they're going to be around for a while, I reckon. And a big plus for the recording of all the singing of all the uh, 80s rock anthems and sending them around to your friends because singing apparently will be good for your respiratory function. Yes, absolutely. The more, the more Zoom-based karaoke you can engage with, the better, I reckon. Bring it on. <laughs>